You're shutting me off? Okay. Should, and Gabriel I, I will now introduce our speakers. Yes, okay. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce these speakers and welcome the godmother of herbal medicine, Rosemary Gladstar, back to her home, at least virtually. And we hear it'll be in person in May. Rosemary grew up next door in the Wildwood Nursery and at her farm in Sebastopol. She was the founder of the California School of Herbal Studies in Forestville, the longest running herb school in the country. And she founded Rosemary's Garden in Sebastopol, where she also went to school with Kathy O'Brien Bricks and another school uh, mate who's here. Uh, and so she is, Rosemary has been practicing, living, learning, teaching, and writing about herbs for 45 years. She is the author of 12 books on herbal medicine and the author and director of the science and art of herbalism, a popular home study course. In 2018, Rosemary was awarded an honorary doctorate for her life work from the National University of Naturopathic Medicine. She is the co-founder and former director of the International Herb Symposium, the New England Women's Herbal Conference, the founding president of United Plant Savers, and the co-founder of the very successful traditional medicinal tea company. And there's a, a website, www.scienceandtheartofherbalism.com. Thank you, Gabriel. The, her, the conversation with her fellow speaker will be with Anne Armbrecht. Anne is my friend from two decades ago in Nepal, where she did her anthropology doctoral research for Harvard University in the high Himalaya. Anne wrote that dissertation as an award-winning ethnographic memoir entitled Thin Places, A Pilgrimage Home. Anne became a student of Rosemary and began a journey following herbs to their source all over the world to explore whether that healing power of plants that she learned about from Rosemary could be found in global supply networks. Anne reports the results in her recent book, which is a great read, The Business of Botanicals, exploring the healing promise of plant medicines in a global industry. She is the director of the Sustainable Herbs Program under the auspices of the American Botanical Council and has co-produced the documentary, Newman, The Nature of Plants. Both Rosemary and Anne come to us from their separate homes in Vermont. Rosemary and Anne, we are so honored to welcome you. Uh, so please uh, let us welcome Anne and Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, so Anne, I just want to yes. say it's so nice to see you, even though we live in the same state, I don't get to see you nearly as much as I used to, especially with this darn pandemic happening. So I've got my cup of tea and I'm looking forward to just sitting and having a wonderful conversation with you as well as all of our guests. Well, likewise. And Gabriel, thank you for that introduction. I just wanted to say Years ago, in like the late 1980s, when I first met Gabriel, the, the, the work he was doing in Nepal and the work I started to do under that umbrella continues the themes that Rosemary, I experienced and learned about at Sage Mountain, really about how can we better care for the earth? How can we live in right relationship with each other and the planet and plants? And so it's great to be here with you both. And Rosemary, I wanted to start with a question for you to, you know, we heard from, from Gabriel about your long history with working with medicinal plants. And if you could just talk a little bit about some key maybe moments, what, what brought you to herbal medicine in the first place and some key, you know, how that journey has been for you. Yeah, it's a long story, but I'm going to keep it yeah. super yeah. short here. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, ha I have to say, I really feel like so many other people who are in love with plants and have 
been called into service by the plants. I, I really feel it was the plants calling me from the time I was a little child. And being in an environment and being with people who actually encouraged that in me. So as many people who know me know this story, but I my grandmother was Armenian and she was an herbalist and she was a survivor of the Armenian genocide. And it was, she just felt it was so important to teach all of us, all of her grandchildren about the plants. And in the traditional ways, there's usually a person in the family or in the community who has this ancient association with plants. You know, I call it, it's like green blood, it runs through us. And I think everybody has that spark, but for me, it just uh, happened when I was really young. And I also just wanted to help people. You know, I think that was sort of natural in me as well. So it kind of, you know, I opened up my little herb store because there wasn't any herb stores in Sonoma County or in Northern California. And it just started that journey for me. And um, yeah, I've been internally grateful for it because it's just, you know, like when Gabriel was saying those things I've done, I really just feel that all I did was say yes to the plants, you know, it was really fun and easy because I just flowed with what my heart connection was. So did I what's answer your, that question? Yeah, well, I, I want to ask you a little bit more. Um, what's so interesting, and again, hearing Gabriel sort of list it, is you listen to the plants, but they're different phases, you know, it started and, and the herb shop and tradition, and a tea company and then oh, yeah. to teaching and then to United Plant Savers, that work. And, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about insights from like, you, you started working in a tea company, you started the tea company and then moved away from that. And, well, business and just wasn't my thing, you know? And even though I have been, sometimes people call me an entrepreneur and I just laugh because I'm really like probably the worst business person. I've had good luck. I think that's been it and I work hard, but mostly what I've done is just followed my heart. But yeah, I did start off, you know, like running the herb store was never like a business. And I don't think I ever very made money even from it. You know, it's just, it was more a service. I really wanted to provide, I wanted, first of all, herbs weren't available to people nor was education available. So that was the first thing was just making them available for people and then realizing people needed to learn about them. And, and starting the herb business was just, I was just making herb blends in my store for my community. And it was really my partner who was a, just a brilliant businessman. And he also loved the plants, but he just had that business spark. And so he followed that spark and really grew traditionals. When it started to be a big company, I wasn't really interested in anymore because it just, for me, it didn't connect me in the way that I wanted to be connected with people. And that was really just, Transmiss, transmitting that energy and empowering people to use these plants in their lives. So I think that was a really important thing. But another thing that happened for me that, and really it had to do with land, you know, it had to do with community more than anything was when I, I started my herb store and my herb business and my school in Sonoma County, where I was very integrated in my community, you know, like I'd gone to high school with these kids and I'd gone to church with them and I'd known my community since I was born, really. But when I, and so all of my work focused on teaching people about the plants and how to use the plants for themselves. But when I moved to Vermont, I moved to wilderness. I was in, I didn't know a person there. I was living lo alone, you know, in this community of plants and I really didn't know the people. And that turned my entire focus to the plants themselves. And that's when I began probably what I consider my most important work. I love bringing herbs back to the people, but really I feel more than anything, there's this renaissance and this, in, this incredible interest in herbs more because the gardens need our help. You know, it's really like we're being called back to protect what really needs our help. And so my work really began focusing more around conservation. I still taught and I travel because I could make money doing that, right? I don't make a lot of money trying to save plants, but <laughs> um, but anyway, that really has become probably the, the latter part, of, like the last 30 years, that's been more of a focus for me. So, yeah. Can I ask you to tell the one story about, so at the time when United Plant Savers was birthed, it was a particular moment in the herb industry. There was this kind of renaissance of herbalists and herbalists making products and selling those products and maybe not as much awareness as 
there could have been around where those plants were coming from and how they were cared for. And I just love the story you tell about both how you got the idea and then that first meeting when about the herbal conscience, like the conscience for herbalists. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Yeah, so, you know, at, I would say at that time, there really was no talk um, about where the plants were coming from. And in fact, you've played a major role, a major force in that, Anne. Thank you so much do your work in the last many years. But, you know, mostly it was just, we were so excited to see the herbs selling or our classes taking off, you know, cause it really, when we first started in the early 1970s, there was very little interest about herbal medicine outside of a very small group of people. Now, I always like to point out that there were ethnic communities certainly who were still using their traditional medicines and the native peoples and also pockets of people in the, in the deep South, but primarily those people didn't have access to modern medicine. It wasn't like a choice, oh, we want to use herb medicine because it's groovy or in, you know, incredible or whatever. It was just, they didn't really have a choice. So, so we're talking about, it was a, we were just excited to see the plants available to people. And we hadn't even really begun to consider where those plants were coming from, right? That, that was, I think, a really important switch. When I moved to Vermont, that's when that realization really happened to me because I had I was selling a lot of the plants from the Northeast and I'd never seen them. It, really important plants, like plants like golden seal and black cohosh and blue cohosh and uh, the blood root. You know, these are important plants in our Materia Medica and some of them are important plants grown only in the United States that are used as world medicine in, pharm in the pharmaceutical industry as well as by herbal companies. And so when I came to Vermont, it was like, oh, I get to meet these plants, right? Because I, you know, I just love the plants with all my heart. I wanted to meet them. So those first couple of years, I spent so much time hiking. We, we lived in a vast wilderness. So we had a 500 acre track of land that about 20, 20, 26,000 acres that was part of an 80,000 acre wilderness behind our backyard. So these plants should have been there, right? This is their habitat, their native habitat, and they weren't. And I was walking one day in the woods, actually I was thinking about these things, these things, and I was walking in the woods and I really literally heard the plants talking to me. Like it was like a conversation. I've always heard the plants talking to me, but it's usually not in English. You know, it's like sound or movement or feeling. Um, you know, this was just like English. It was like plant us back in these woods, right? And that was the spark for me. And it was like, yes, we can, there's a problem here. We've helped, um, we've helped create that problem by making herbs really uh, more noticeable, you know, bringing them out into the world market in the United States anyway. And so we were hosting, it was actually the second International Herb Symposium was 1994. And we had herbalists from all over the country there. And I invited a small group of, herbalist who represented all the many aspects. So there was the business person, the producer, the clinician, the folklore herbalist, the wildcrafter. We all sat in a room together and we just started with a question, is there a problem? And if there is a problem, what can we do about it? And every single person in that room, every single person, no matter what their background, had all been thinking the exact same thing as I had. They'd all been noticing the same thing in their fields and in their backyards. There was a problem and we needed to do something about it. And so we just, none of us at that point had ever formed a nonprofit. We were really babies in the woods, right? But we started a nonprofit called United Plant Savers. And you've been very active in it, I know. And it's really in the last 25 years become an amazing voice for the plants. And its primary mission, it's actually its focal is just the medicinal conservation or the conservation of the medicinal plants of the North American continent. Yeah. Thank you, Anne, for asking that. I, you can tell I'm very impassioned. Well, no, I have some good questions for you too. <laughs> well, I love what you had said, and then I'll let you ask a question, but what you said when, when I was doing that early research on the history of United Plant Savers, that everybody, that all the herbalists were focused on my product, my company, my school, and this was a chance to sort of step back and look, okay, what's the larger con, you know, we're talking about the earth and the plants and, and that stepping back has been so important in my own journey with medicinal plants, you know, that it's not just the product or the school, it's really, if we're talking about ecological health and wellness, 
Yeah. We have to talk about ecological health yeah. and wellness. Anyway, yeah, the plants always lead us to that. You know, like all of our listeners who are gardeners and who work in love with the plants, who work at their native botanical gardens, they all know that the plants are, you know, they are just incredible holy beings and they take us right to the earth. There's no way, you know, it's, there's that old image of the herbalist kneeling to the earth. It's almost like in prayer. And that it is really, I think the act of when we go down to the earth, we receive so much. And, um, and that I think was, it was, you know, herbalism in this country was based in around the world was based on, you know, what it is the plants could do for us. And they've done tremendous amounts for us, both, you know, health wise and food wise and all so many ways that we can talk about later. But this was an opportunity to ask what we could do for them, you know, and I think it really, uh, I think the herbal community had matured at that point um, to be able to step forth and do it. And the herbal industry was very nervous in the beginning. They were like, who are these? Because we showed up at those huge expos that are all about business with this message and they were resistant, but only in the beginning. Most of them, a lot of them, I would say, joined forces and pretty quickly and pretty early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I just follow with a comment from, from that? Because so as my, well, one thing about your teaching is the power of helping create that connection between the person and the plants. And then like trusting the unfolding of that, that by listening, we each will go on our own journey with those plants. And so mine has taken me, you know, into the industry world where, you know, those trade shows are quite shocking. And yes, there's a group that recognizes United Plant Savers, but there's a lot, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of different um, people, companies, agendas, you know, it, it, and so that really that tension between that connection with the plants that you talk about and that green blood and this industry that's driven by, you know, the logic of capital. There's this, anyway, that's a tension that I've been exploring, as you know. And just recently, I, this past fall, I brought together this group of supporters of the Sustainable Herbs Program for a, a series of conversations to really try and get at, you know, a lot of people talk about the challenges in sourcing, but it's hard to get actual change happening. And so we were trying to talk about the root causes of that. And we made these two maps. One was a map of the current reality. And then, then we were sort of listening into the future to what might emerge. And this one woman, an ethnobotanist, Erin Smith, in her first map, she works at Banyan Botanicals, which is one of the best companies out there that's super committed to the planet and plants and people. And still, she said, I wanted plants to be at the center of my map, but I realized they weren't. The industry just isn't set up in a way that plants really can be. And so then in her second map, she put them right at the center. And these are these lovely diagrams that I took pictures yeah. of. Plants are at the center. And she said, now that informs her and she thinks about in her decisions, like how can that, you know, so anyway, it's just a tension. That yeah, that's beautiful. Tension. I think that's all, you know, sometimes the change looks so difficult and so hard, but that's all we have to do is we just have to put what's most important in the center and then everything settles around it. We've just done not, done a really good task of always doing that in the, in the industry, not just with the herb industry, but we see that that is kind of how capitalism has been set up. But we, it's not that it's impossible to change. All that people have to do is start rearranging their maps and putting what is most important, which is health and well-being and love and, you know, right livelihood and all of that in the center and everything will start roti rotating around it. It's, it seems like an enormous shift until you do it. And then it's like, it makes perfect sense. I know for myself, you know, I, in all of like, let's just take one of the herbal conferences as an example or an herb school. You know, I have always had to think about how to make it work financially, you know, like how much you could pay people and how many teachers you could bring and how many teachers you had to say no to not. But I always, always would bring myself and I would worry about the numbers. You know, you have to if you're running a business. So that it's not like I was immune to that, even in my small business model but I would always bring what I was trying to do to the center. Like, oh, so what's most important here? Oh, it's to spread herbal information. It's to unite people, it's to create community, you know, to make joy. 
and and then everything did work out. It's not that all of those events or classes or my herb store ever always worked financially, but in the end, it all worked out beautifully. It's just trusting, again, to move what's most important to the center. And in this case, I would say with the plants, with this herbal industry that we're talking about and all the many facets of it, the plants are what are most important. You know, it's, it's just amazing when you shift them into that center. <laughs> hey, I have a simple question for you. And then we can get back to some of these more ponderous things. But I have a, I know that, um, you know, we, we want to talk about this kind of broader idea of, of the herbal movement right now and some of these global issues and global health. And I think those are really important conversations right now to have. But I also know that it's a lot of the times people are interested in herbs because of that aspect of what, how it is that they can help us. And I know during winter time, especially is a time when people are more prone to illnesses and colds and you know all the sometimes depression because of the long winters especially here in the northeast um, but i have to say even when i lived in california and i was acclimated i would think our winters were long and cold there but i learned i learned since moving to vermont that sometimes a cold winter evening is like a warm summer afternoon in vermont so it's all relative but um, I know when I was first forming this tea company, so many of the teas were about, you know, herbs. They were like, you know, it was gypsy cold care and throat code and the immune enforcers and stuff. So I just wanted to ask you um, what your favorite herbs are to have on hand for winter health. What you use for you and your family that might be helpful to for our listeners. Well, and that's two questions. What do I use for myself and what can I get my family to take? <laughs> I, I love garlic and fire cider. I don't make much, have so much success getting the rest of my family to chew cloves of garlic or uh, make fire, drink fire cider. Um, and then things like echinacea, elder, elderberry syrup. Although, you know, they, before COVID, I made this big thing of fire cider that I never used because we never went out anywhere. So how about you? What are your favorites? Yeah, they're pretty much the same. You know, I would say for winter health, it would definitely be echinacea because, um, and I always call echinacea like the great herbal diplomat because it was it was in the 1980s when it was introduced. Interestingly, it's a North American plant, right? It was very well known by the uh, native uh, tribes, uh, the native peoples of the prairie lands. Um, but it was introduced to us from the studies that came in from Germany. That's when Americans woke up to it, it was through the germ use of herbal, the herbal industry is much uh, more developed in Germany and in Europe than it was in the United States in the 1980s. So actually all of our information about echinacea at that time was coming in from Germany. But it, I always called it the great herbal diplomat because it really introduced herbalism to the American public. It was, it worked, it was a beautiful plant. Many people were growing it in their yards. It grows so readily and easily. And it really does increase white blood cells, you know, so it, it acts kind of as a first line defense for bacteria and virus because it's both antiviral and antibacterial. So it's a great one to have. You know, and it's expensive, as you know, to buy those little one ounce jars of tincture. So I really have been an advocate for people learning how to make them. I mean, honestly, for anybody here who is listening, who knows how to cook or knows how to even just mix a few things together, like make a mixed drink. It's that simple to make a tincture. And there's tons of instructions on the internet or you can buy my, I have a really excellent book for beginner herbalists that's really teaches you how to do this yourself in your kitchen. It's so much fun. And plus it connects you with the medicine that you're making, which is so, so important. But yeah, so echinacea and then elderberry, that's another one that I mean, it's astounding how expensive it is to buy elderberry syrup, you know, and how astounding how inexpensive it is to make a quart yourself and simple. You know, if you, you just boil up some tea and add some honey to it, and there you've got elderberry syrup. And again, the instructions are available so easily. And it's a major antiviral and antibacterial. So you, you just have it, it's covering all the systems and it tastes delicious. Yeah, and then I am a firm believer in having a little golden seal, and it always brings up that ethical issue because golden seal is one of the most well-known herbs from the North American continent that's been shipped for the last couple hundred years to markets around the world to the point where it's been severely over-harvested and is terribly endangered. 
So here I am an advocate, right, for plant conservation, and yet I still am an advocate for using golden seal. But, and I, so I really believe in using these plants, but buying them from cultivated sources, because then you're not only being able to use the plants, but you're supporting another endangered species, which is the American farmer or the farmers of the world. You just have to be willing to pay a little bit more. But when you compare the price of herbs against the price of pharmaceuticals, it's nothing, baby. You know, I mean, really, I, it's hard to, and plus, you know, like a quarter ounce of golden seal, which might cost $20, will last you the whole winter. But it's a fabulous herb to fight infections. Yeah. And then fire cider. <laughs> Well, fighter cider is, is a product, right, that you just make in your kitchen out of vinegar. You can buy it now, too, but you just use vinegar and then you put culinary herbs like your garlic and your ginger and your horseradish, your onions, maybe a little turmeric, and you have this amazing infection fighting formula. It's probably one of the most famous formulas in the United States right now. <laughs> yeah, so it's probably the only herbal formula I know that actually went to federal court and won. So that's a story in itself, but um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, those are, I have a lot of other ones, but those are some of the basic ones. And um, and I would encourage those of you who are listening to really, you know, stock up a few of those good herbs, thyme and rosemary, some of your culinaries, oregano, some of those are some of your best infection fighting herbs and are really excellent for winter health. So I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, Anne. And can I add just one thing about the herbs for yeah. if, if people are going to purchase them to buy certified organic, you know, organic is not necessarily a perfect certification as the New Yorker article revealed, but if you're taking these herbs for your health, to me, it makes no sense to, to buy an herb, even if it's slightly less expensive, that's been grown in ways that's going to been shown to cause disease for the people growing it or to the soil. And so it's so, yeah. as well as for yourself, if, if you're gonna be drinking tea, buy herbal tea, organic herbal teas um, for your own health as well as the planet. So. Yeah. Well, that changed my question. I was gonna ask you, I, actually maybe, I was gonna ask you about Newman, which I love that amazing documentary that your husband and you did and um, that won so many awards, but. I think maybe what I do is just segue right in and we can come back to that. Well, but, actually, go ahead and ask because I wanted to comment okay, something great. about that. Yeah, I, I want to highly recommend. I know they have movie night at Oakmont and um, I know that you, this, this film is available, but it's such a remarkable film to see. And um, yeah, so do you want to just mention a little bit about that, Anne, so people know? Oh, well, the thing I wanted to say, well, so we, I, we, we produced this film because I was doing research for you, Rosemary, remember on United Plant Savers and talking to these amazing herbalists and then trying to write about it. And as I was writing about it, I thought, oh, it'd be much more powerful for these herbalists and more importantly, the plants to speak for themselves. And Terry, my husband's a filmmaker. So I was like, oh, let's make this film. <laughs> so, and, and so we did, and it's celebrating the healing power of plants and kind of the cultural framework of traditional Western herbalism so that it's not, you know, all the, the, the sense of relationship with the plants that you talk about so much in your teaching that often doesn't reach the marketplace. So I really wanted to celebrate that. You know, when someone's in a grocery store and they buy a capsule or a tincture, they don't have any sense necessarily that it's about this right relationship with the earth. And so we made this documentary and as we were screening it, around the US and some overseas, what struck me was how the audience either got the message and they're like, yes, yes, you can make remedies in your own kitchen. I can make echinacea for my children and give them nettle tea. Or it was this foreign concept. They would buy organic food only for their children at the farmer's market or the you know food whole foods or whatever. But medicine was something that was at the pharmacy. And so I was really struck by that difference of, because what you were saying, it's so easy to make these basic remedies. It doesn't have to be something so um, expensive or, no. yeah. And, and, and so, but what struck me then in making that film and how it reached certain people and not others was that to reach those other people, I needed to go to the supplement aisle. 
And so then that was kind of the seeds for writing the book, The Business of Botanicals, really to follow those plants to the source and tell the stories of the people and places behind those products when all we can see is the box on the shelf to really understand, okay, herbalists talk about the importance of that relationship with the plant and how that's part of the healing. But what happens to that relationship when you're using ingredients that are sourced from global supply networks? Is it still there? And you know, how do you find it? What what might it look for? What might it look like? So that was anyway. That was an amazingly brave undertaking, you know, like when you first told me that you were going to write the book and uh, what it was about, I was thinking, oh, who's going to want to read that? The business people will be, you know, because it, because it's like it was like a mystery story of, un un of revealing layer upon layer of stuff that people don't want to look at. Like where where are these botanicals really coming from? I think it's, a you know, it's a lot like all of commercialism right now, it's like our clothing even, you know, when we start tracking like what, where our clothing, where our beautiful clothing are coming from, you know, it's not all pretty, you know, and some of it, once you know it, you, you definitely start to make very different choices because all of us want to preserve this world. And we all know it's so important to join together to do it. And we are, sometimes shy away from the simple things that we need to do. It's not even big things. It's like going into a store and making a choice that, oh, this is organic and, oh, it's grown locally. And it might be a little bit more expensive, but I'm supporting a farmer that I know actually, you know, or plants that are growing locally. And that, you know, that does bring us into that bigger discussion of medicine because, you know, really when you try to define, when people ask me how I define herbalism, most of the time, when people think of an herbalist, they're thinking of somebody who's dispensing herbal medicine. But what I always think about it is, would you define medicine for me, please? Because medicine can be working in your garden. It can be actually right now, the best medicine for a lot of people would be being able to join hands in prayer around the table with their family and friends, right? There are so many different things that make us well. And sometimes even the most on diagnostic, diagnostic, uh, you know, illness that you have with all the right medicine doesn't work on a person and yet they go see a shamanic practitioner and they have the right song sung and I mean really I know I sound a little far out but this is totally true in the world of healing those people will be healed and so you know we can't really define medicine other than it's what makes each individual feel better and so when I think of herbal medicine I'm thinking of the farmer and the gardener even the beautician is putting beautiful things on your body that make you feel better. Um, you know, that make, just makes you feel better in your life. And, and so, but, but what's the deepest underlining thing of all of that is our relationships. And it goes as deep as our relationship with the plants. And so, you know, there, there's story after story after story told of people who have chronic long-term illness and they start working in their gardens and they start planting their plants or hospitals that now have healing gardens and how people just, you know, it's not just the plants, it's all of nature coming together. And that's probably one of our greatest healing forces. And that I think is what you try to address. It's, you take people on these bigger conversations and, you know, you're really addressing global health in your book. I, the title of it, I've never really been happy with. I think it should be called the soul, the heart and soul of verbalism really the heart and soul of botanicals because it's really not about the business it's really about that underlining connection that people have with their medicine and with global health i would say don't you think so Anne? yeah the uh, um i was just told by an herbalist the other day that the book wasn't for herbalists and i was like oh interesting <laughs> yeah. um i think the title more like the medicine of place something that captures that web of relationships. Sometimes when I show, do a presentation, I show an image of just a bottle, a tincture bottle set against a, a white screen and ask people to think about, okay, what questions do you ask? And right, what questions you ask, or I would typically ask is, how is that gonna help me? What's in that? Is it on, what's on the label? You know, kind of quality questions and, and with me. And then I set that same tincture bottle against an image with, the environment and the plants and the harvesters and the processors. And so it's embedded in this larger world. 
And then I ask what questions does that make people think about? And they're inevitably different questions, right? It's about the, the relationship that you're talking about. Um, and, and how does knowing that relationship change our choices? Like if, um, yeah, if you, when we think about that, you know, Verl and Klinkenborg and William Cronin and Wendell Berry all talk quite a bit early on in the eighties, I read each of them and they talk about how not seeing the people and places behind the products we consume allows us to forget the moral and ecological responsibilities of our ways of living. And so how, like by seeing that, does it help us remember, think, okay, we can spend a little bit more in the grocery store, especially those of us who can, um, you know, to have that difference in that. So, but yes, it was an insane project to, to begin and do and, and impossibly hard to do the research and even harder to, to write about it, so. Yeah. Well, you did a lot of traveling, I know. That was, it was like an adventure story in many ways. You actually traveled to many parts of the world and met with the growers, right, and the producers. Um, yeah, can you give some examples, Anne, of people who were doing it right in your way of, you know, how you would say they were really contributing more to global health than, um, are there any examples you have of that? Yeah. Well, I think one key thing was I started with very black and white ideas. It was going to be good or bad. And I realized it's much more complicated. And that's why I kind of told this, wrote about it in more like this unfolding journey, detective story, like, oh, this is what I found here. And this made me ask these questions rather than this is a good company and this is a bad company. Um, and so the, the ones that stand out are where people are paying attention and and, and so people, that means visiting. So that, like, I think most of us in the supplement aisle don't really know how many steps there are between that product and where the plants actually come from. And sometimes there's, there's the person who's making that finished capsule has no idea where those herbs are from. And, and so we saw some places where there was herbs bought and sold on the open market and really poor quality, really poor drying conditions, workers who aren't well paid. It's really, you know, like all, any supply chain, you, you look where our food comes from, it's, it's scary. And so you want to know where the company, even if they're not making site visits, that they know there's a chain of custody all the way through. And, and so that relationship means that say somebody responsible for sourcing for banyan or traditional medicinals has a relationship with that producer. So if that producer, the, the wild harvesters, they're having trouble that year, they can't, whatever, harvesting the specific plants. It's not like that company's gonna say, okay, we're gonna go find it somewhere else. They work with them and they figure it out. Okay, how can we, what do you need from us? What do we need from you? And, and so that relationship is very in details. It's like, terms of trade and when the contract, you know, if they give an advanced contract so farmers can plan ahead and order seeds and hire workers or, you know, so that's the kind of thing that's a right relationship and, or not bargaining on the price, um, right? Because there, there's such pressure on price for the raw materials. And so the trading companies that to me seem to be doing it right are ones who say, they do their research, like they're good business people. They know I'm not gonna overpay for this, but they also trust that a farmer is telling you what they need to, you know, what it costs them. And so it's this connection where that connection is found. I think that is the companies that I, I purchase herbs from now. Yeah. I don't know if that really answered your question. I kind of went off, but. No, it's good. Yeah, it's good. You know, one of the things when you were talking and I was thinking about the tremendous generosity of the plants, you know, I was just thinking about how they have impacted all of our lives, everybody's lives in so many levels that we often don't think about, you know, and it, I think it's always been one of the foundations of my teachings that I've always wanted, you know, I remind myself of this all the time. I've never gotten tired of thinking about it, but how you know, in, in, every, in every creation story around the world. So no matter how you believe, you know, how you trust the world was created, whether it was created by the almighty God in seven days, or it emerged out of the waters as Turtle Island, or 
you know, emerged out of the goddess mouth or however it is, the plants were always here before people. So they, so we have evolved in relationship to plants and they impact us on every level. It's so even what again, it goes beyond just that idea of medicine, but you know, you think about our food chain, like whether you eat lots of meat or you eat all vegetarian, your base, that cow is out there eating grass, right? The basic of everything we eat is plant-based. So, you know, the food that we eat is from the plants. The medicine that we take, herbal medicine is the oldest, safest system of healing known by humankind and still the most widely used system of healing in the world. This is quoted often, but it is a good quote from World Health Organization. It's rather an old quote. It comes from like the late 1980s, but at that time they were saying that at least 82% of the world's population still use herbs as their primary system of healing, not secondary, but primary. So, um, you know, still the most widely used system of healing in the world, the most ecologically sound, the most e economical system of healing that we have. Um, and also the clothing, almost all the clothing we wear, rayon, cotton, silk, you know, all that clothing that we like, it all comes from the plants. Everything that we look around us that's so beautiful, you know, that's often like, the earth is coated with grass and flowers. And so just the beauty way that helps heal us, right? And then of course the air, the very air we breathe is a discharge from the plants. If, you know, it's the oxygen we breathe is actually a byproduct of the plants breathing. So every breath we take is in relationship to them and um, their generosity on so many levels. So, so then that payback is simply recognition, right? I think that's what you were saying you know, the core of what you're saying is that, you know, how we serve them back is just by attention of what, how we're using them, where our gratefulness is, right? I think it does make, it makes a difference, um, not only to the farmers and to the medicine that we're using, but to actual, to the plants themselves and the planet, when we start to talk about global health, you know, which I know is a very huge topic for you. So do you think that you can be a good herbalist and not be an environmentalist? <laughs> I think people are. I, I mean, I think I, I actually feel, I, I love hearing your optimism. I can get quite discouraged by the disconnection between, um, there's a lot of focus on the plants and how they can be used in different ways. And there's not an equal education about where those plants are, like the geography, the medicine of place, that those plants, that nettles are different, whether they're over harvested from rural Poland by wild harvesters who can't make a living, or Romania or Albania, you know, a lot come from Eastern Europe, or by farmers in Vermont that are growing them organic and, and organically. And I feel like there's a lot of room the herbalism maybe gets a free pass that it's more ecologically responsible, but it's not inevitably more ecologically responsible. I think, you know, the work around farming systems right now and soil health and, you know, that we have what, 60, that was an old statistic, six years old, we have 60 harvests left because of the topsoil. And so it, even herbalists often talk about cultivated versus wild harvesting, but there's also how are the cultivated herbs grown? and how is biodiversity being supported? And there's a lot more that people who use plant medicine can do, I think, to really support companies that are trying, 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 trying to do this work, but they're competing on the grocery store shelf for companies that aren't doing any of that, but maybe saying they're doing it. And, and so, yeah, no, I don't know that question. I think we, we don't get a great grade right now. We get an okay grade. <laughs> yeah, I think part, I think there's two reasons why I remain optimistic, or oh, maybe three, I think it's just in my nature, right? I think I was trained really well by my mom and my, my father, um, who were just good farm folk living, you know, in Sonoma County, trying to make a living farming. And of course, it was back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s when, you know, farmers were just being driven out of business. It was the saddest thing. But um yeah, systematically by the government, you know, the small dairy farmers. But I remain optimistic because I see the difference actually from when herbalism, when I first became 
you know, public with herbalism is in the early 1970s, when there was no discussion about um, the ecology, you know, and conservation and attention paid to where plants were coming from. And it is true, what we've seen is this immense market grow. So the problem has gotten bigger, but the awareness has gotten really bigger as well. So I'm positive about that. I think I'm also just positive because, you know, when you, when you look at the plants and how they've survived through generations and eons, I said, not generations, eons of time. Like I live in a place here in Vermont where every single plant that is here is absolutely different than what was here 10,000 years ago because an enormous glacier sat on this land, ground the mountains down to little hills and totally changed the landscape. And yet we live, when you look just in 10,000 years, the lushness of the plants that are here. So I just think that there is a life force that's on this planet that, um, and we're just a young species trying to learn how to catch, we need to catch up. We have a lot of catching up to do to learn how to be respectful members of the greater community of life on the planet for certain. But there's so many people like yourself who are doing amazing good work. And, you know, I know when we first started talking about United Plant Savers and about plant conservation, those, it took like 20 years before anybody even listened to us, right? So you just have to keep at it, Anne. You know, I know it's, you've been doing this, carrying this message for about 15 years, but you just, the thing is not to give up. We just have to keep carrying it forth. And slowly people are waking up. You know, there's much more conscious awareness of these things going on in the world. So thank you for your good work. <laughs> thank you for your inspiration. I want to, I think we are supposed to pause sooner and invite questions. Oh, um, sorry about that. No, 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 that was both of us. Um, Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, what, let me just first give the audience a chance to appreciate your fantastic talk and such inspirational and educational uh, things. So please, let's thank. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> And we want to first give the, we'll be alternating questions between the uh, audience in person here, about 30 people, and uh, those on uh, Zoom, which uh, uh, I see there's 112 participants that George will uh, uh, be taking. And I do want to give the, f the first question here. Um, I'll ask one while, if you do want to, if you want to be on camera so the Zoom people can see you, come and stand here where I am, and you can take your mask off and, and use the, the mic. But while I see if there's anyone here, uh, I just wanted to ask, you said you had certain companies that you do trust, and we'd love to know which ones uh, without, uh, I'm sure you're not getting a commission on it, so. Uh, if you could give that. And if anyone here wants to do a question, please raise your hand. I think that question was for you, Anne. Oh, I was going to. So um, part of this, I resist this question because to me, the most empowering part of herbal medicine has been learning how to make remedies myself and having that direct relationship. And so then when people want to be recommended companies, I feel like that misses out that potential for engagement, right? Asking the questions, thinking about my the values, the things I care about with herbal products. So if it's ethical wild crafting, or then it would be fair wild certified, or you know, fair wages for farmers, then it would be something that's fair trade. So I do, and I have a lot of content on the Sustainable Herbs Program website or in my book that talks about like how to have that deeper engagement so you're not just a consumer of a product but really like seeing that by purchasing from this company I am supporting the values that I want to kind of disseminate in the world so I'll say that and then I also know that we all want companies that make a difference and the companies that I write about in the book I mean there it's traditional medicinals and pucka I write a lot and in part that's because they were allowed me to visit their projects there are plenty of other companies um, that for various reasons, I didn't necessarily have that access to. A good place to look is on the Sustainable Herbs Program website on our donor page. The companies that have 
committed financially to support and pretty significantly financially to support investing in responsible sourcing. I feel like that's a good place to begin. And not all of those companies are brands. A lot of them are ingredient suppliers, so they're behind the scenes. But there are companies like Herb Farm, Banyan, Paca, Traditional Medicinals, um, and a lot of others that I don't, I'm not going to remember right now. So, and, and something to look for is that there's an herbalist in the company, that it's, it's not just a product that sounds sexy, that there's someone who really knows how to use the plants and and if I might that? also add to that too, it's like source locally as well. You know, like yeah. you have so, so there's so many herbalists who are creating really good products just locally all across this country, you know? Um, so, you know, if you have a, a small local herbalist who's making products, you know, and selling them at farmer's market or just one or two markets, you can, you know, maybe not a hundred percent, but almost always across the board, you're going to find that they're just trying to do things right and serve their community. Wouldn't you say, Anne, that those local people are, you know, yeah. And, and I do wanna also say what Anne was saying is that you don't ever wanna call a company up and say, are you collecting these things ethically? Like, did you do ethical wildcrafting of your golden seal? Cause they are always gonna tell you, yes. You know, you have to have different questions to ask. Um, yeah. Thank you for, for framing it the way it should have been framed. George, may I hand it over to you? Yeah, we, I've got two comments. Uh, first, there was a lot of interaction on the uh, Zoom group about what the Newman uh, reference was to. Uh, oh, yeah. The video is called Newman, N-U-M-E-N, -E The Nature of Plants. And that is posted over in the chat if you're on the, video, on the Zoom. Uh, in addition, there is a link to a Vimeo um, uh, recording that you can listen to. You can get a 48 hour rental and listen to the video. Uh, and I, I would ask you just slowly, would one of you please uh, elucidate on the uh, website that Anne was referencing? So I, can write it in the, I can write it in the chat if you wanna okay. go ahead. Uh, for those in the in the live, oh, the chat will work because the, the live audience will see it. Oh, okay. So Sustainable what? Herbs Program. Okay. If you just search that. Sustainableherbsprogram.com or .org. .org. <laughs> okay. Uh, in, a, in a related question to the one you just answered, uh, we have a question here that's just slightly different. Um, how would you approach a particular company to find out that it was a good quality source of herbs. Um, what, 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 what would you do if you were us? I mean, we're just everyday people. We're not, okay. How, how would you approach it? You wanna answer first, Dan, and then I'll follow up. Yeah. I feel like certifications are a good first step. They're not always because like a local farm, it's too expensive for them to you know, go through the certification process. Someone, um, in Costa Rica said certifications are a stand in for a relationship, but if you can't have that relationship, then they're a good marker. So I would say certified organic, certified for fair trade. I mean, less than 5% of the herbs on the market are certified organic. So, and, and, and that's partially because companies don't hear the demand. So, but you also, so um, quality, and this is a longer conversation, but a big part of my research was showing that care and attention through the supply network, paying attention to how herbs are grown and processed and handled is directly connected to the quality of that finished product. And there have been studies to show this, you know, they measure the chemical constituents in finished products and they're higher quality when it's a shorter supply chain. And we, so, so then that's, even when I ask people like the head of the botanical adulterants program at ABC, what he looks for, he can't really answer this question in a clear way. So it's a challenge, you know, the, looking for quality, but it's, it's not the cheapest product. Don't, don't go for that. Um, and then Rosemary, I'll let you jump in. Well, I also want to say it's not generally the cheapest, but it's also, there's a lot of really expensive products that are 
crap, you know, so yeah. it's not really based on the price so much. Yeah, I just think it's like, as much as you can, like knowing your local sources and, um, and it, like Anne was saying, it is complicated. Like one of the things I look for is what are they supporting? You know, like they usually they'll have a, a site uh, on their websites of what, what organizations they're supporting. So generally if they're supporting things like the sustainable herbal products uh, or the United Plant Savers, and then they have um, programs within their programs. Like a lot of these companies actually are doing amazing projects um, in the countries where they're getting their herbs from, you know, so knowing if they're supporting actually the women of the villages and bringing water to the villages and starting schools with their money, that's all really important. Again, companies that aren't really ethical are doing those things too, but I know I kind of want to blurt out a bunch of companies that I really like, but I, I understand what Anne is saying, you know, that it really has to be each person kind of doing that, that work themselves. But one of the things that I want that I want to say is I also really agree with what Anne's saying is my whole mission in life is to bring herbs back into people's homes and kitchens, right? And it is so easy and fun to make these herbal products. It's what people have been doing for thousands of years. So when I come out in May, I can come there and do a workshop on hands-on preparation, how to make your echinacea syrup, excuse me, echinacea tincture, how to make elderberry syrup. You know, even for the non-cooks, it's like that's the power right there. And ideally growing it. If you have a little yard, you put some echinacea, you put a little elderberry bush in the corner, you know, you plant some of these plants and then you just go out in your yard, you know, and yeah, it's pretty, that's direct connection. But I know that not everybody can or wants to do that. So then try to support your local herbalists, your local companies that are doing that for you. Yeah. I'm supposed to look this way, so I will look this way. Okay. Um, oh, hi. 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 This and I don't think you're gonna you're gonna answer this because you've been very diplomatic, and this is um, a question really about differences in countries. And I'm thinking, you know, I've I've heard a lot of um, things about say that the ginger producing uh, ch chain in in India and in Nepal, which is which may be um, good in terms of being organic but it's very bad in terms of they corner the market um, in many cases and and don't give the farmer very much uh, return for their products and things like that i'm just wondering do you find the uh, a difference between countries in other words in india um, you'll, you'd have a longer history a thousand year history of production of some of these uh, uh, products but you might not have the same uh, ability for government regulation. In the United States, you might have lots of regulations, but lots of ways to get around them at the same time. So do you have a sense of um, whether you know, the United States or Europe or Eastern Europe or uh, different parts of Asia are better or worse at uh, this kind of relationship? That's a great question. Yeah, great um, question. Yeah, and a couple of different thoughts. Um, first, early on, well, early, and it's less so now, but the US in the late 90s and early 2000s was kind of known on the market for the price buying that, that countries with a long-term tradition of buying and producing botanical medicines like European countries, India, China, had grading for the quality of the raw material and what didn't pass their grading would be sent to the US because the, the tradition of knowledgeable buying of botanical raw materials was broken. Um, and I talk about this in my book, but, and, and so that as that's built up again, the quality is improving again in the US. That's kind of on the end side of the supply sourcing. In terms of sourcing from the beginning, you know, Joseph Brinkman told me early on when I was trying to say, you know, China, is it good or bad? And he said, you can find the best quality herbs in China and the worst quality in China. And you just, you need to be more aware because of in countries like China or India, because of the potential for like heavy metal contamination or all of, you know, 
the ecological impacts on the herbs, but also the con working conditions, as you were saying. Um, and so I think when we were in India for six months, uh, we ended up seeing a lot of really bad companies actually that were some hundred year old Ayurvedic companies with um, poor quality control, poor, no sourcing control and newer, smaller companies that were able to invest in that in a much better way. So there's, I'm, I'm not just being diplomatic, it's that it's, there's not an easy answer. And a little diplomatic, <laughs> <laughs> which is good. Yeah, <laughs> that was a great question. Yeah. Okay, from the uh, Zoom group, uh, your thoughts on the business of essential oils. Ooh. Go for it, Rosemary. Well, I'll just start and you can add. Um, there's a lot slower even than the herbal industry was for certain. And actually it's more critical because you know the pride of essential oils is that in these little tiny bottles you have just incredible amounts of herb product you know herbal essence in there like you know i forget the exact amount of thousands of roses it makes takes to make one ounce of rose oil so extremely concentrated but m most a large amount of those are coming from wild harvested plants and um with very little concern about the the conservation or ecological uh, nature of where they're coming from. So they're just slowly beginning to wake up. These conversations are just happening in the essential oil industry right now. So they're a little bit slower. I think also, you know, as essential oils have also just skyrocketed in their, you know, fame. They're everywhere now. You find them in box stores and stuff where early on you, they were very rare and very expensive. And I think that there's, you know, they're so concentrated and there's very little education with how to use them. Um, so that's, a, that's an also another issue, but yeah, I just, we're hopeful that the aromatherapy industry is going to wake up really quickly because right now the tremendous amounts of plants that are you, being used. And then, as I said, like these essential oils aren't even being used correctly. They're very, very concentrated. People have to really know how to use them, you know, for, to see them being sold the way they are is actually somewhat dangerous, actually. That's what I think about it. And what are your thoughts? Well, I, at a workshop at the International Herb Symposium a while ago, um, someone, Kathy, I forget her last name, said, Kathy if Cabell. you, yeah, if you, no, not Kathy Cabell, I'm, I'll think of it later, but um, if you want to use essential oils, you need to spend a month researching to understand the issues in sourcing and manufacturing. And I wasn't ready to spend a month doing that research. So I sort of stay away from them. So yeah, huge quantities. And then there's energy costs, you know, huge amounts of energy. We actually visited a super exciting project in Costa Rica this, um, this past summer, which is with a US-based company, Thrive Care. And they are partnering with a co-op to extract some essential oils for some of their products. And it was one of the most inspiring projects I visited because of this, their super regenerative agroforestry practices and the community was totally in charge of their part of it and really thinking hard. You know, they're not perfect. They haven't figured out the heating part right now. They're using propane, but there are examples out there. But yeah, I think the essential oil aromatherapy business is... Um, you need to do your research before you buy them. Yeah, I mean, and with that said, you know, there are a lot of um, a lot of people now who are investing in their own little copper stills and using their own plants from their garden and making just incredibly it's high quality essential oils. I know my granddaughter Lily; she was given the little copper still, and it goes out into their farm, and they just gather all the mint and stuff and makes their own. It's very doable again to do at home and to do it consciously and to make sure you know that you're using the plants from your own garden. And that is a place that, that I see the potential for growth with the aromatherapy industry is to really concentrate on organically cultivated plants. Can you imagine the amount of farmers that that would, you know, that they would be able to hire and, you know, it, it would be a great thing for American farmers that are struggling so hard with traditional crops or their dairy lands and stuff is to be able to grow these plants for 
making high quality local oil. So yeah, there's there's potential again for positive outcome, but you know, people are just so not educated in either where these plants are coming from or how to use them. And there just needs to be a lot more education on that area. Good questions, by the way, thank you. Yeah, they are good. I would just uh, name, name at least one name and see whether uh, I can get a response, an affirmation from uh, Anne and Rosemary. I worked a lot with uh, the Dabur company, which is a mammoth uh, Ayurvedic company, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar. They even have a branch in Seattle. Uh, and uh, they, we worked, they were doing some very exciting things sustainably. They, because taxes, you know, for the, the uh, cervical cancer was being over harvested. They had developed nurseries with high speed production uh, where they could use all parts of the plant. Yeah. They had Jatamansi, you'll know the proper name for that, and I can't remember it. I think it's spikenard. They, what? It's Himalayan spikenard, right? Yeah. It's not yeah. the same spikenard as what we have here. It's the yeah. French perfumers use it, and they were really raping the Himalayas. But the uh, their Dabur had started to develop some uh, nursery plants through the Mountain Institute back up in Humla where they were doing very good sustainable production. And I had some big workshops with them. Anyway, I'm naming a name that I worked with them <laughs> and they hired really good foresters and ecologists. And I don't know if you will affirm that. Well, I will, you know, so I, I, I never was able to visit Dabur, but I was up in the Indian Himalayas um, looking at supposedly farmers that were cultivating kutki and mostly it was a failure, but I saw the employee from Dabur and he was the most energetic, hardworking person who was working with, he was running around working with these farmers, trying to help them at a different project to cultivate the plant. So I was impressed and he didn't have more than 10 minutes to talk to me because he was so busy. <laughs> that's, <all> <laughs> I, that's my direct positive. But we're actually hoping to go to Nepal next fall. And so I'll follow up with you to look at the um, Fair Wild Jatamansi project, which is in Humla. So to, to sort of tell that story. So I'll follow up with you later, Gabriel. And you need to organize like a, a plant lover's journey to go to visit some of these places. Yeah. <laughs> uh, George? Uh, let me start by saying that uh, there was an enthusiastic support, uh, Rosemary, for your having a, uh, uh, a, a group here when you come. So, Great. okay, so just remember that. Um, uh, Allison had asked a question, and I'm not sure because we, she's been off and on as to whether she's muted, so I'll ask it for her. Um, if, if you were going to become involved in the commercial production of um, the herbals, okay, what is the best reference to get you started? In other words, understanding the, that process, uh, what would be good plants to start with, you know, what kind of conditions. I mean, it, it, you know, we all start from what we know, which often isn't enough to actually get started on something. What so you got? Are you, so um, are you talking about commercially growing? Because if so... Uh, yes. Uh, yes. It, the question was, if you were to work, uh, be yourself a, a commercial grower or work with a farmer who... Uh, had an interest in becoming a commercial grower, where would you start? Well, I'd recommend my um, daughter and her husband's book, The Organic Herb Farmer. It's a really excellent book. They're, or, they're successful herb farmers. I think Anne would agree they are doing an outstanding job of growing really incredibly good organic herbs. Small scale, you know, um, they're a, I think they farm about 10 or 15 acres total. But they wrote a really incredible book that is um, printed by Chelsea Green. And it kind of goes from the very, you know, how to start up and how to price your herbs and how to sell them. And it's very detailed. And then there's also a book written by an herbalist in California uh, that's on the cultivating of Chinese herbs, actually. Uh, and it's, do you remember, Anne, the name of that book? Peg Schaefer, I'm putting these yes. in the chat. Peg Schaefer is her book. Yeah, She's that's in, Chelsea in. Green. Chelsea She's Green, I think. Yes. I think Chelsea Green is her publisher too. I put oh. that in the chat. 
also. Yeah. Would you recommend? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'd already typed book. it in. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. Uh, and then there's there is a book written, I believe, by Tim Blakely too. That's on. Um, oh. uh, are pretty sure that I forget the name of it. There's there are a couple other books right now that I'm so sorry that are kind of eluding me, but I can say that those two that we just mentioned are really excellent resources. I think there is one by Tim Blakely and. And there was one written quite a number of years ago, but I'm sorry, it's kind of, it's- The, the one by Tammy Hartsung, right? The 100 oh. medicinal plants, th that was really helpful for me. You had recommended it, 100 yeah. medicinal plants to grow. Yeah, that's a great one, actually. She grows in the Midwest. She grows in Colorado, actually, is where her farm is. And that's a really wonderful book. And that one is also good for just home grow, you know, people who are having their homegrown herbs with not looking to do it commercially, but- it's a very, very excellent book. Thank you, Anne, for that. Yeah, yeah, there's a good, those are good resources. And there's also in Sonoma County, because I know a lot of the listeners are, there's the Herb Growers Association in Sonoma County that is a collective of organic growers and they offer workshops. So that would be another good resource actually to, you know, just connect with the um, organic, the Sonoma County Herb Growers Association. Uh, George, should we go for a final question from? We, we have a final question. Um, uh, if you were starting off and you wanted to read a book about herbal medicine, uh, what would you read? Rosemary. <laughs> Rosemary is a family herbal. Rosemary's books are fantastic. They're, they have her spirit infused in the book and super concrete, simple things you can do and lots of remedies for simple conditions. I have them all. Yeah. The family herbal is the best place to start, I'd say. You well, you know, I think I, that's that's one of my very favorites, but I think that er, the um, Medicinal Herbs, A Beginner's Guide right. is okay. probably the best for people who are just starting because it it's limited to maybe, there's maybe a discussion about 40 or 50 of the most common and readily available plants, how to grow them. And then the simple instructions for making medicine. The one that Anne's talking about, I love it better because it has a lot of the stories. It has a lot more information. But when you're first starting, I think that that Medicinal Herbs, a Beginner's Guide is probably a very first one. And with that said, there's so many good herb books being written right now. There's just, a, when we look back at this age in the herbal community, it'll be known as the time of herbal classics. There are some beautiful, incredible books being written all the way from the clinical practice all the way to the folklore and tradition, you know, just covers every gamut. And I do highly recommend anybody who's interested in the issues of global health and the industry, you know, in natural food, natural medicine, and definitely in the herb, herbal world. Anne's book is brilliant. You know, as I said, the title I think doesn't do it justice. It's part adventure story, it's part travel journal. It's very deeply, which you can tell from Anne, she's very deeply insight, insightful. She does not stay on the surface of anything. She goes deep down into the roots of it. And the book is, she's an incredible writer. Um, so I just can't, I really highly recommend it be read. It's not necessarily what you'd call an herb book. You're not gonna sit down and get, you know, how to use herbs for this and that. But it's, again, it's addressing these really important issues that are actually important to all of us, whether we're using herbs or not, it really has connects, it's a way of connecting us into that global health that we're all so concerned about right now. So. Thank you, Rosemary. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I meant every word of it, so. <laughs> thank, yeah. thank you guys for an absolutely yeah. super talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs>